All right, so we're about halfway through the semester. Guess what that means? Does anybody want to take a big guess? So, here's the plan. Monday. Monday, at this time, this place, we will have an exam for our midterm. It will cover everything we will cover this week. If we get into Chapter 5, it will not cover Chapter 5. Anything we have said in class, talked about in class, that's out of Chapters 1 through 4, or material that we have turned in here is subject to being on that exam. I have not written the exam yet, but it will most likely be mostly essay. It will be done here in the classroom. If you are not able to be here, we will have to find a way to take that. It will not be available online and in Blackboard. And that's simply due to some issues we've had with exams being on Blackboard. So it will be a paper-based exam. It will test your brain a little bit. And it will test your brain in the critical thinking sense. How do I figure out what's going on in this particular environment? So last week we went through Chapter 4. We started on it. There's a lot of important pieces in, yes sir, I have not decided that yet. It will probably not be open book, because open book also means open Google in here since our book is electronic. And I want it not a how do I search on Google, I want to be able to you to use some critical thinking. It will not be, hey on page 37 there is a figure that says 22.4. It's not going to be that kind of exam, but what I'm going to do is, is test your brain and your ability to reason and think critically. So there may be some questions very similar to the cases that you see, and I have one example of this week, of here's a reading assignment, what could they have done? So rather than what is the total number of Internet users in the U.S., those kinds of things. So there will be a difference in that. So it is not designed to be impossible. It is really just a, are you with us? Are, we, are you critically thinking? And are you looking at now the world a little different as we start looking at information systems from a business viewpoint? So that is the one thing that's probably a little challenge is we'll do a lot of things from a business versus an individual viewpoint. So when I say, and we talk about, for example, network operating systems, and let me point this out as an example of what, what that difference might be. You get a computer and you have a network operating system. You join onto some kind of network at your house. You're on the Internet. Wow, that's great. I can do whatever I want. From a business standpoint, is that what I want you to be able to do? No. From a business standpoint, I want to control you because I don't want you to put any kind of software you want on your own computer. Why would I not want you to put software on your own computer if you're in my business? What's the, what's the harm, you going out and just downloading software willy-nilly? You can get a virus. What about if you don't have a license for that software that you've downloaded? Can I as a company or can the company get in trouble for that? Yeah. So, in fact, depending on which class you're in, I know I've told this story several times, I was in a company that got hit for several hundred thousand dollars worth of fines for software that we inadvertently didn't remove, and we passed computers from engineers down to secretarial staff or administrative staff. But we made the mistake of not removing the software, so it could have been ran. So there's a lot of those differences. So that's that difference of looking at it from the perspective of a business versus the perspective of an individual. As an individual, we want to have freedom. We want to do whatever the heck we want. From a business, we want to put some, some stops on that. We don't want you to print unlimited numbers of copies at the copier, because that's money. We want you to think before you print. And so there's some differences in that. We want you to, if you need to install software, we need to make sure that it's, it's software that can run. Maybe it's incompatible. Maybe you have a license for it, but it also crashes some of the other software we run in the company. And so we have to think about how those things interrelate. So that's a good slide for that because it kind of points out those differences. When you think about from a company standpoint versus your individual standpoint, things look a little different. 
And hopefully all of you want to go out, be managers, you want to own a company. So a couple of terms you're going to see. NOS does not stand for nitrous oxide system in this class. Everybody knows what nitrous oxide systems are, right? No. Oh, man, you guys need to go watch Fast and the Furious again. Nitrous, like in a car. Oh, yeah. So the other place, has anybody been to the dentist and hate going to the dentist? No, oh, only me. You guys all love going. At some points, they may use some gas and relax you. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. So NOS can have a couple of different meanings. Here we're calling it a network operating system. So Windows is a network operating system. Linux, Windows Server, Mac. Your Chrome OS is a network operating system. Your phones have a network operating system. It's that software that controls your computer or your device. So on top of that, we put programs that do things. But the base underneath there is Linux or Windows or Android or Chrome. In that, we may have management software. So a lot of times, one of the things we do is we put in software that monitors where you're going. So even here as a college student, and you've got your phone, and when you signed up for your email, it actually there was a checkbox that said, do you allow the college to monitor and change my email? And you can actually wipe out your email on your phone. I do it when I signed up, and it said, hey, I can remove everything on your phone remotely wiping it because you signed up for that agreement. We want to monitor and maintain and see what's going on. So even more dramatic, think about what happens if we have a criminal investigation in our campus. Have we had those? Yeah, we have had several of them. I actually had a student a few years ago who I'm reading in the, the paper, local paper, and all of a sudden I see that this student has been arrested for federal child pornography charges. He's my advisee and a student in this class, or a class similar. I'm not sure which class he was in at that point. Do you think they decided that they needed to check his email and look through the records of the stuff here at college for him? Yeah. Think about in this building. If, if I arrest somebody for child pornography, what's really bad about this building in particular? Mm. What happens if you come in the back entrance of the basement and you go downstairs what's down there there's a daycare in this building so what was interesting was he actually got out on a federal bail and they said well you can do you can't touch a computer anywhere except at the college campus well, wait a minute so I we got involved and we had to figure out what can what can you do because we really don't want him near the daycare that's a bad idea right so as it turns out though since he's never been convicted of anything it's very difficult to restrict you Kind of a frightening case, but similar to if we have a criminal incident. So if all of a sudden we have a giant brawl on our campus and 400 students are involved in it, would they search through your emails and through your campus records? Yeah. Yeah, they would try to identify what's going on. So that network management, not only does it, does it monitor, like, what are we downloading, but we can also see what's happening in terms of errors. So if there is an error with our software, or if we're getting a lot of download errors. So it's not only for controlling us, but it also can give us some power to see what's going on. All right, no, no student can get an email. What's going on? So that network management software gives us a lot of tools. At your house, you tend to not have that. As a business, we do. As we go into a couple of other things, there's something called MDM, or mobile device management. Where this really comes into play is we monitor and manage all these little devices like our phones, tablets, laptops, Apple devices, whatever it is, and it gives us control over those devices because we want to monitor and see what's going on there also. MDM software. So you'll see that term a lot. The other place that it comes into play is something called BYOB. Bring your own device. BYOD, sorry. Bring your own device. And a lot of companies encourage that. Hey, bring your tablet to work. You can work on your own computer. You can work on, but we have to have some way to monitor and maintain it because we don't want the guy over there searching on the porn sites while the rest of you are working. Or even worse, maybe they're doing, you know, trying to commit some kind of a terroristic act. How do we know? MDM software. 
This is really a new term that's coming about, SDN, Software Defined Networking. Software Defined Networking says, well, not only do we have these controllers, but now we're doing it whether you're on our physical network or not. So I have some software on your computer, and I can actually monitor your laptop, whether it's on our campus or not. Well, from a business standpoint, I need this, because what have I done in this pandemic? Where, am, where are all my employees now for a lot of companies? Are they in the office? No, they're at home. And so I still need that same level of control and monitoring. And it can even include things, if you really want to get down to it, there are some companies who monitor how many keystrokes you make or whether your mouse is moving, so they're not paying for you if you're sitting there and you're sleeping. So, there, yes? Is, is a com and it can be, and here's why. If you have Microsoft Office on your computer, but you have the student version, which is what you have from here, for example, it actually says if you read the licensing, not for any commercial use. So you've just made it a commercial use entity, and that very well could be an issue. So employers, and, if, and you had bought it on your own, it would depend on which version you bought, whether it's legal or not to have done that. So companies very carefully try to study that and figure out how do, I, how do I do that. And some of them do something. So Microsoft has some programs called Work at Home and other programs where your employer buys office and you get to use it for a small fee. And then, in, then it would be legal. But it is a question. How do I work with software at home? And we're sending out all of these employees out to their houses. Do we have all the required pieces for them to work? And in some cases, we didn't during this pandemic. We panicked. We didn't know what to do. We have more employees working at home than ever before. How do I deal with it? And we have to figure out how do we deal with that safety of our data. We don't want to just send it to you on a flash drive and send it to your house. So we've set up VPNs and other tools that you're going to see. How many Internet hosts? Really not a surprise that the Internet is growing, is it? I hope not. The internet has huge growth, huge growth. We still, though, only have about a third of the worldwide citizens able to access the internet. Here you don't think, hey, everybody's on the internet, but look carefully around you. Especially if you look at like an older population in, say, Auburn or Nebraska City. Do you think there's a lot of, the, of, of older people that don't necessarily have internet service? There are people who can't get internet very easily. I've actually had several students who were working on their classes. The way they could submit assignments is they would drive to somewhere like a McDonald's with an internet hotspot because they lived out in an area where they couldn't get internet or they couldn't afford the internet. We're coming up to a, an election in the United States. And I think by now you're starting to see that the internet and those things on the internet, we're going to talk about social media later a little bit, but they have a profound effect on what's going on in the world around us. Is it always positive? Maybe. There's a lot of really good things. We can get some good information. Is there a lot of crap information out there on the Internet too? There is. But can we also see in other places, so now everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody's able to upload data. Have we seen things that we would have not seen before? Yeah. I think across the United States. So... As a disclaimer, I grew up in a household, my dad was a police officer. But I think we're seeing now across the country, we're seeing episodes of people who shouldn't be officers. They're bullies, and now we're able to see those. But I think we can see that in a lot of industries. It's not just in the, in the police. 99% of them are probably really good guys. You have a few people that, unless you have some control on them, on the same side, now nearly all the police departments have body cameras. So that's good from both sides, right? So we get that information, so we can pull that all that data. And we can see what's going on. We have other countries where they have censored very heavily data, but, but citizens are able to report back. And so all the way back, if you look at Tiananmen Square in China, where people have been oppressed, now suddenly we have these, these outlets. So is the Internet great? 
sometimes. Is it bad also? Look at things like child pornography, how easy it is to distribute child pornography now. Look how easy it is to cyber bully people. So with anything, there's always a good and a bad to that. So as a really quick history lesson, the Internet actually came from our U.S. military. So it was something called ARPA, and then it became DARPA. It was a, a Department of Defense effort. So they thought we at some point were going to have a nuclear war. In the late 60s, early 70s, that was the thought. At some point, we're going to have nuclear war. We need a communications method that even if different places across the country get destroyed, that we can still have communications. And the Internet was actually originally designed for that. It's designed to be able to move around a little bit. So if, hey, the pathway through Chicago is blocked or destroyed, I can find an alternative pathway. And so the packets of data can have multiple ways to get to their location. And that's what its original, original design was for. So... You have something called Internet Protocol, and that's really where you get the addressing and some of the other pieces. Internet Protocol. So you may see this term, TCP slash IP. And that's really how you get information from one computer to another. And here's where our book and this slide is wrong. So I pulled this out, and I, I could change it, but I like to talk about this because we don't understand what's going on. And it says, the book says, hey, you have a 64-bit address. Well, nope, that's not right. When I say a bit, I mean a 0 or a 1. The original IP addressing is 32 bits. So there were 32 zeros or 1s in a string, and that's what we normally see for IP addresses. Never have we used a 64-bit number. The newest standard, IPv6, is 128 bits. I'm still not sure where they came up with that unless they decided to say, let's just pick a number in the middle. But the reality is those, those 32 bits are what we typically see as an IP address. When they're typing something in, you watch NCIS, and they're typing in four sets of numbers for an IP address, that's what they're typing in is that 32-bit address but converted to, converted to decimal. So this is kind of a simplified version of how we communicate across the Internet. It goes to a router. So this router forms the outside of our network here at the campus. So our college campus ends here. These are all out on the Internet. And then suddenly we've got another one on, on the other end. So we don't know how many routers and gateways and different pieces that, that traffic can go from. And we don't care as long as it gets from point A to point B. Think about the letters you mail out. Do you care what cities they actually go through as long as they get to the final destination? The same way with the Internet. We don't care as long as it goes from point A to point B, and it does that in the way that we need it to do. To do that, though, we need a couple of little nomenclatures. And one of those is something called a URL, and you guys have all used it. When I type in Cengage.com, or I type in peru.edu or Blackboard. That's a URL. It's an address that says this is a specific location and that we're going to map to a, a place. Some computer is going to serve that up to me. So there is a, a link between them called DNS. And if you take the networking class, we dive into it a little bit. If you take the cybersecurity, we dive into it a little bit as how it can be insecure. And somewhere, because the computers only understand numbers, and we're really good with names. So there's a service that says Google.com is really this number. So it's like a phone book for the Internet. And you don't have to know the details of it because it just works. Domain names, then, are what we're going to get. And so domain names end in something specific. And this is where it's really weird, some of our nomenclature. We call it a top-level domain, but it's at the back of the web address. So if I have a .com address, the top-level domain is .com. And all together, all over the world, 
there's only 123 million of them. Oh, interesting. Now, this is 2015. Do you think that's still accurate? No. No. But these are some of the top ones we have. So, .biz, .com, .edu, and sometimes we see the .edu. Where do we see it at? Educational institutions. Can anybody get a .edu? No, only education institutions. .gov, .net, .org, or for nonprofit. There's other ones you're going to see. .mil, if you're in the military, you'll see .mil a lot. Well, we're seeing more and more and more email addresses. You're seeing more addresses out there. The Internet is expanding. You, yeah, correct. So those addresses are registered by a top-level domain called ICANN. It, it is. We have to go buy that. So if I want, for example, bradgriffinconsulting.com, which I happen to own, I have to pay about $20 a year to have that name registered to me. If I want google.com, I have to pay to have that registered. And there's been some famous snafus. For example, Google about two years ago forgot to renew the name Google.com and somebody registered it for them. Do you think Google said, oh, how much money do you want? Yeah. And what they ended up doing, the guy said, I see. And they ended up giving like 15 grand to a charity. But it can happen if you don't maintain those domains. So it's kind of one of those important things. Once I register one, then I need to make sure I maintain it. How do I connect to the Internet? Well, I can go to Walmart or I can go to, to uh, you know, I can drive through the Iowa truck stops and I can get Internet. But is that really a good way to do it? No. Usually I call somebody and I say, hey, an Internet service provider, and you're going to give me an account. So some ways to do this. So old way. And maybe you still have seen some of that or seen it in a movie where they dialed up with a modem. They had to dial up on a phone line. If you've had to ever use that, that is painful. But that's what we had 20 years ago. Well, very rarely do we need dial-up anymore. So the most common ways we connect now are through a phone company or through a cable company. So how many of you have a cable company as your Internet provider? couple of you. How many of you have a phone company like Windstream as your cable company? Yeah. And there's some lines that are blurring a little bit. So now we have companies like Allo that really aren't a phone company or a cable company, but they've emerged to provide networks to you. So the most typical way in the U.S., though, right now is with a cable company. Companies like Comcast and Spectrum are the largest base of users in the, in the United States for Internet service as a home user. Millions of them. So can I get on the Internet with my phone, though? Yeah. What happens when I run out of data, though? Does it get expensive? Or in the case of most of the unlimited plans, notice the air quotes, what do they do? They slow you down if you run out of data? So the cell phone can work, but I have people that say, well, why do I need to have an Internet service provider? I've got my phone, and my phone says it can tether to another computer, right? It works for a little bit, and then suddenly you're out of data, and you know, we're all sad when Netflix doesn't work again, right? So accessing that Internet, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. The Best connection is probably a cable modem or a DSL or a fiber if you can actually get it. One of them happens to have it. There are people that have no resort other than a satellite internet service. If that is your only resort out, you're living out in the country, I'm sorry. It's slow. It's very data restricted. It's worse than using Wi Fi, quite frankly, or uh, your cell phone. But in some places, that's all that, that you have. 
we're now seeing more over Wi-Fi networks and cellular networks. So out here, if you live in the country, you may be able to use what's called a WISP, a wireless internet service provider, like JAG Wireless, Diode Communications, some of those. So they'll put a little antenna on your house, and you'll, if you're within a couple of miles of their tower, you can actually get internet that way. We have a new change coming with 5G, and at some point, Verizon and some of these companies are going to sell you the ability to have internet with 5G at your house. Is it going to be the cheapest method? Mm, probably not. So, so you, you can use the 5G. Yeah, the 5G is great to use if you have it, but what I think in terms of the phone companies, what it's going to let you do is hit your data cap even faster. Because they're going to they're gonna want their money. And, the, and it's expensive to build that infrastructure. If, if you have the ability to get a cable modem, or if you can get DSL from your phone company, or in the case of a lot of these cities now, so if I live in Lincoln, you can get Allo. In Nebraska City, there's one called Spiral Communications. In Auburn, there's even a fiber company called A1 Fiber. They put a, a fiber directly into your house, and the speeds are unbelievable compared to most of these other technologies. So kind of blends in. It's all the pieces that make this together. All those routers, the fiber optic cables from city to city. And it's all based on this idea of client server. So somewhere there's a web server and we want to go to it. So when we go to, what's a website we might go to? What's a, what's a website you guys all go to? You got a Google, yeah. Anything else? Is that all we go to? YouTube? When I go to YouTube or I go to Google, I'm saying my computer says, hey, go out and find this data for me, and then it sends it back. If you're taking the web design class, you're going to see how that happens on the back end, how you create a website that actually works. So what it really does is your computer says, from a link, typically called a hyperlink, or you're doing a web browser, it says, go out, find this file for me, and download it to my computer. When I go to YouTube, what it's really doing in the background is saying, hey, go out and play this file and send it to me. So, a couple of terms. Web browser, that's some way we view websites. So, it could be Safari, it could be Chrome, it could be Firefox, it could be Internet Explorer, or what's the new name for Internet Explorer? Oh, that'd be a great test question. Internet Explorer has now become still uses an E, four-letter word, Edge. Internet Edge doesn't work any better. Are there other ones out there, or are those it? Oh, there's thousands of different web browsers. We tend to use only those that are already on our computer or we're really used to. Doesn't mean they're necessarily the best. There are things like Opera. I actually really love Opera. Opera is very small, very lightweight, very fast, but it doesn't do a lot of the multimedia stuff that people have on their websites. I like text websites. Here I can get my information in and out really quick. It's not loading all those ads and those different kinds of things. So a web browser goes out and gets the information for us. A website then is a pile of pages or a collection that are all interconnected. So if I go to peru.edu, all those pages we get to, that's all part of that website. If I go to etsy.com, all the web pages you see are part of that website. If I go to amazon.com, all of those are part of that. If I go to zappos.com, all the shoes, all those websites are actually in there. So that is what we call the website. There's some weird things, and you probably have seen some of this, or you will in database, or the, not the database, the uh, web design class. So that page, when it goes out to get it, you don't really control how it gets displayed. Your browser does based on does it listen to all the instructions. And those instructions come in what are called tags. So HTML tags say how to format that data, how to display it. So you see a couple of other ones called XML and CSS. Those are what we call markup languages. They actually say, 
this is how that page should look. But the secret is that browser can say, no, you know, I don't really care. I'm going to ignore your instructions. So that's one of the little secrets about that. Even though that web page says to display in a certain way, it may look different if I go to it on Internet Explorer or if I go to it on Chrome. There are pages that only work in a specific browser. So this is an example of that, that CSS files are one way that we can do fonts, colors, layout, how it builds. XML files usually have the content, we put them together, and that's what we typically call our current style of websites. We put all these things together. So CSS is how it's styled. XML is how we put the containers together. And there are specific XML or extensible markup languages for other things. I think we had at least one accountant or future accountant in here, didn't we? Maybe not. Maybe I'm losing my mind. But things like accounting, there are specific XML for accounting where it stores data in a specific way. So it's just a container. The most common web programming languages you're going to see so JavaScript and Java. Java is very large. Java can do everything that you can possibly want. JavaScript is actually just a little language that sits on the web page and can do fewer things. Can't interact with your computer nearly as much. They are not as related as you would think based on the name. But there's a lot of other ones. And so we talk about Python in a programming class and we introduce you to it. C++, C++, Perl, PHP. There are 600 plus active programming languages out there. Yikes. Luckily, if you understand one or have an idea how one works, you can generally fumble your way through some of the other ones until you become proficient in it. But we don't necessarily need, if we're just going to display information, you're going to see that we can display it pretty easily. It's when we start getting into interactive that we start having a little more complication. So that XML, that's how we transfer that data. That data is the important part. How we format it is probably, to me, a little less important. I want the data preserved and the formatting a little less important. And that XML is how we format it. Most websites now are not hosted by that corporation. So GE doesn't host their own website. Peru doesn't host their own website. We typically do it in one of a couple of places. In Amazon Web Services, so you're going to see that a lot, AWS is one of the most popular. Huge amounts of the web depend on Amazon. It's not just shopping that's made Jeff Bezos the richest person in the world. The first person that may become a trillionaire in your lifetime. Trillionaire. And he already gave half away in a divorce, and he's still worth a couple hundred billion. Crazy. But it's a lot of where that income comes from is he's built this giant infrastructure called Amazon Web Services. So yes, they make money when you shop on Amazon, but they make a lot more when you're using websites that are being paid for on Amazon Web Services. So how do I create my web page? So if you're in web design now, and I think some of you are, we make you hand code stuff. It's painful. It's horrible. But it's the way you learn what's underneath that website. On the other hand, there's a lot of what we call WYSIWYGs, or what you see is what you get editors. So Dreamweaver. There's versions for the Mac. There's all different kinds of these WYSIWYGs, where I just drag around and I throw content together, and magically it appears. The problem with those is when something doesn't work right, you need to have those code skills on the back end to be able to fix it. So, There's also other things. So web content may have active content. So you may have .NET or Java running in the background. So all different kinds of things to make those interactive pages. Some companies have even started to write their own language. So if you want to go to work at Facebook, and if you don't know, Facebook is building one of their giant data centers up in Papillion right now. A billion square feet. This building is about 60,000 square feet for comparison. 
and they're going to have a billion square feet of space. Crazy. But they're writing some of their own language to try to make life easier for them. And that leads us into what I think is either the best thing in the world or the worst thing. Social media and 2.0. So Web 2.0 is really the idea that Web 1.0 was the web pages were static and you saw information. Web 2.0 was you were able to upload information to that page. So things like reviews of products, that's Web 2.0. You're putting information out there and adding it to content so that I can see it. That led to the ability to have things like social media. And social media has a lot of impact on the world. Facebook has a huge impact on elections. Tinder has a huge impact on dating. Well, there's other websites too. I have not watched that one. There are, there are a lot of very interesting perspectives on how involved some of these social media sites have become and how impactful they are on things like elections, world events, and it's not just necessarily just us. So social media, is it good? So let's talk about social media. How many of you have seen TikTok? What's going on with TikTok right now? They're going to get banned in the U.S. Oh. So there's a lot of different pieces in there. So apparently Trump the other night signed a law saying, hey, we'll let it run for a little bit. The idea was that they were exporting content and it was going to be used as a spying site. My guess is Captain Twitter Pants didn't really understand what TikTok was. TikTok, though, has some other downfalls. TikTok is the number one site for sex trafficking in the world. Oh. And if you start looking at TikTok, you're going to start seeing some things that are a little frightening. Are there 14-year-old girls in there shaking their bits? And there are 80-year-old men, well, maybe not 80, but whatever, old perverts, let's call them that, people my age, looking at that and going, hey, how do I buy this kid? My own 10-year-old, for reasons that she no longer can see a phone for a while, because all of her friends are making TikTok videos, and they're making them to, to songs that, A, are not appropriate, and so I have an issue with that. But more importantly, she's got her shirt tucked up, and my 10-year-old is developed, and I'll bring her, she may have been here in class, and you guys, I don't know. But she's fairly developed for a 10-year-old. Crop-topped her shirt, pants hiked up to her hoo-ha, hanging out, and dancing to suggestive videos. And one video alone, within one day, had 1,700 views. And I guarantee that was not her, all of her 10-year-old friends. Yeah, she, she apparently has a lot of friends. So is it good? Yeah. Because the other reality is that, will I sit there and scroll on TikTok and watch videos and, and laugh for hours? Yes. But on the other hand, number one traffic site for, for sex trafficking. And we think we're kind of isolated out here. This is actually a very heavily sex trafficked area. And one of the areas that if you want to be really frightened or you want to go see is actually the, the Walmart in Nebraska City. Because people come in off Highway 2. It's also the gateway then north and south. And there are a lot of exchanges of people in that parking lot. It has been identified by Health and Human Services, and I'm hoping that they're monitoring it, but then they'll move to another area, which is unfortunate. And we kind of think sometimes we're kind of blind to some of those, but it isn't. So social media is great. I've got to reconnect with a lot of my classmates on Facebook, because you know Facebook's for old people now, right? I met my wife on a social media site. That part's great until I'm in trouble, and then it's over on this side again. But we have to balance those things, and we have to think things with a critical eye. If we look at all the information being thrown out on social media, we know 90% of it's crap, right? I hope. If we start believing things without actually researching, then social media, I think, gets very scary. 
and if we don't protect ourselves from it. Even things like, hey, I'm going to post on Facebook that we're leaving for a two-week vacation, and I've posted enough pictures and things that people can figure out what my house is. Can that be scary? Yeah. I really don't want somebody to break into my house. So the Internet's got a lot of great things. News, education. It's how you're going to find a job. You're not going to look at a newspaper and look down for job ads. They're not even there anymore. You're going to find your jobs online through networking, through things like LinkedIn, Career Builder, all these different websites, the company sites. Most of them you can't even apply with a paper application anymore. Hell, at Walmart you can't apply with a piece of paper anymore, can you? No. It's changing. And if you're not able to change with that, you're going to have a, a, some issues. So you have to use those things. So search engines. So the search engines are how we tend to find information. And most of us just say, hey, I'm going to Google it. But the reality is Google is not the only search engine out there. And it may not be the most appropriate one for you. There's a lot of other search engines out there. I actually have a friend of mine who's now retired at my age because he brought out a search engine. He created a search engine, startup company based out of, out of Kansas City. Little startup company, had a, had a competitor to Google. He's retired because guess what? Google bought him out. And I will tell you, we go out for a drink. Mike, you can buy the drinks. Because he made some pretty good money off of that. Part of that, though, when we're running a business is we want our business to be on top of those searches. When you search for education, it'd be really nice if Peru showed up at the top, right? So there's something called, a term you're going to see is called search engine optimization. And so there are companies that will come to you and say, hey, we're the masters of search engine optimization. We're going to figure out how to get those search engines to point to you. And sometimes they can do that for a little bit. Because Google and these other big search engines are constantly changing their algorithms or their methods to try to avoid being played. So in other words, they want to sell an ad to put it up top, but they don't want somebody to get free advertising or buy through a method. Because one of the first methods used to be, I would just put up a ton of keywords in there and it would drive that traffic to me. And we're way past that at this point. So search engine optimization is a term you need to know. You're going to get bombarded if you're in a company with emails from companies saying, hey, uh, we're the search engine optimization managers. We can do it for you. And in some cases, they can, but check it out before you start paying money. Thousands of dollars a month. Little Auburn, Nebraska pays their web design company, I think, $1,000 a month for search engine optimization. And I'm going to suggest that's probably, well, maybe. I don't know what they're doing, but. I don't think it's necessarily they're getting $1,000 worth of return on that. So the other one we need to think about, especially as college students, is how do I get into those journals? How do I find that peer-reviewed? How do I find information that's not just the top link on Google? Well, it's the most common way we can do it. Aside from having to go over to the library, what can I do? It is a way we can do it, but what else can we do? Well, we can still use Google. What are we using Google to get to databases and journals and those? Google Scholar. Google Scholar. And in fact, we don't do it here. But it's amazing because my wife works for UNL. And on her computer, if I use Google Scholar, it, it will actually jump through her account directly to that journal article through UNL's account. And it's pretty sweet. When I do research, I love Peru. I teach here. I love a lot of things we do. Do we have the resources of a, of a big university? I cheat, and I use my wife's ability to get into that stuff, because they have things we can't get. But does Google Scholar still return results for you guys? And some of them you can get. Not necessarily. You may have to then go into another. You may have to go to the library virtually. You can get there and go to our catalogs and start looking at it. We're going to introduce you to this idea of instant messaging. So on top of all the social media, now that companies have shoved all their employees out to their houses, we need some way to get a hold of people. 
And so we're going to actually look at and show you guys one product called Teams because I can shove all of you into one big team together. How many of you have used Teams? Anybody? Oh, you'll be my team master. Anybody else? No? What about Slack? Parrot? Instant messaging of any kind? Well, you probably have on things like Facebook and didn't realize it. Or you sent somebody a chat in Snapchat. So we also have all these other terms that you're going to run into. How many of you have a Twitter account? Be honest. All right. I do too. I used to make everybody post Twitters. And Twitter is, I thought by now Twitter would have died out a little bit because it kind of peaked and it wasn't really gaining a whole lot of viewers. Twitter does something interesting. You have to send what are called micro blogs or micro messages. You can only do 140 characters, right? They've expanded a little, but the, the original basis was it was 140 characters and which fit into what we call SMS messaging. We had to get creative. How do I send out a lot of information on Twitter? And what you're really doing is sending now a link on Twitter to include your additional content. So Twitter, though, can be useful. So I can go listen to the president every day. You guys are like, oh, yeah, I guess you can do that. Most celebrities have a Twitter account and are posting something. A lot of athletes post things on Twitter. And we can see news channels are posting things on Twitter. And we can actually do a scan, or we can do a search through Twitter, and we can pull up data about things like hurricanes. And we can figure out where they're hitting, or the flu. Or we've used it now with this pandemic. We can actually pull data from Twitter to see where it's hitting most hard. And we can kind of predict what areas might get hit next. And certainly during the election, are we going to see a lot of Twitter? So I'm going to put that in the bad category just because the election is going to drive us crazy before it's over. Are there other bad things people can do on Twitter? If you start thinking about and you go back, have there been college athletes lost their scholarships because they weren't able to not post something stupid on Twitter? There have been. Have there been people lost their jobs over Twitter? And in fact, the best one I love is there's a story in Iowa Guy lost not only his job and some other things, for a Twitter post he had put out several years ago. Because unfortunately, when we put something out in the internet and in social media, it never goes away. And we have people that are being punished for things they said 20 years ago. And I'd like to think I'm a different person than I was 20 years ago, but it never goes away. Data stuff stays here all the time. That post you have with you and a beer and you're out on a boat somewhere, that has been enough to have people lose their jobs. Or if you post something and your language is inappropriate or you're referring to a group of people and maybe they're all friends of yours and you're joking, that can come back and haunt you very, very badly. So when you start posting on any social media, do that double take. And go, should I really post this or not? Yes, I'm mad. I shouldn't think about it. And so the one I always use is, would my grandma approve? Now, use the grandma approach. And you think about, what am I going to post? And usually that will keep you out of trouble. Unless your grandma was really exciting and did some really crazy things, that should keep you a little bit out of trouble. So. When you post on things like Twitter, and there's all kinds of other ones. There's LinkedIn, there's Tumblr, there's, name me another social media site. There's all kinds. Instagram, FooBar. There's hundreds and hundreds of different ones out there. Now some, there's some new ones that are divided into liberal and very conservative groups, and people are posting on those. Take some thought into what you're going to post, because it can certainly come back and haunt you very, very badly. Let's see if I time this just right. Here's where we're going to head. So not only does Teams do conferencing, but it can do that instant messaging. What's the most common video chat service right now? Is it Google Voice? Is it Skype? Or is it something else? 
Zoom. And in fact, we hadn't hardly heard about Zoom until a couple of years ago. And they're one of the few companies that has made this pandemic a great thing. Now, I will say from a security standpoint, Zoom is an absolute crap show. If I'm a company and I'm going, man, I have some high stakes data, I am not going to be using Zoom because it's got a lot of security exploits. Doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. We use it here. We also use one inside of Blackboard. How many of you used Collaborate before? Have any of you done Collaborate? A couple of you. So they all do kind of the same thing. They allow us to create a video chat using a camera. We can take over your screen usually, or at least show you our screen. And so it's a really great way we can try to mimic being together in person. Is it the same? No. And in fact, I feel sorry. All these K through 12 students, if that's how they're doing education is through Zoom. I'm a little suspicious. This is going to bite us in the butt in a couple years when they start getting older and older. But our business is liking Zoom. What does Zoom allow us to do? Does it save money on sending people places? Now, right now, we can't send them in a lot of cases anyway, but think about some of these conferences we go to. Even here at the college, we go to a lot of conferences, and we take students as many times as we can. But So we go to a conference in Denver. So our time's gone. You're several thousand dollars to go to a conference. In some cases, the conferences alone are a thousand bucks to go to or more. Great. Now, I can just put everybody in one big Zoom link. But it's not the same. My wife trains health and human service workers, and they are now, by the state, has said, we're not going to have live classes until at least January. And so they're trying to train people who already have college degrees. They're already out there, in some cases, working as health and human service workers. Do you think these guys can pay attention on Zoom? No. So if the 24 to 30-year-olds can't pay attention, I'm pretty sure the 8 to 10-year-olds are not paying attention at all either. So it's kind of funny because sometimes I get to sit in because my wife's doing a Zoom, and so I get to hear, Carol, put down the other stuff. You don't need to multitask. Quit snoring. For the love of God, why are you doing your Zoom from your bedroom? She actually had an employee, a prospective employee, laying in bed. Just put the laptop up on her chest while she's laying there with the covers over her in bed. professionalism and Zoom don't necessarily go together. So think about that in terms of how do I make those proposals and how do I do those things when we do it. So other things that you're going to see, blogging and podcasting. Some of you may already have a podcast. Does anybody have a podcast you do? Nobody? Huh. So I was actually surprised. I was talking to my 24-year-old son. He's a grad student up in South Dakota, and he's already, got, he's already a certified athletic trainer, but he's going for his master's degree. He's actually started a podcast, a weekly podcast, and they have thousands of athletic trainers all signed into this podcast. I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. And he's using that as his selling feature to go out and find a job when he gets done. So he's been talking to the head athletic trainer at the Chiefs here recently, and they've been talking back and forth. And so one of the things that was kind of cool was he invited him to come down and see the, the Super Bowl ring. So he sent him a picture, so Zach then screenshotted it to me. I'd love to have a Super Bowl ring. I didn't know the tra athletic trainer got one too. That thing's the size of, a, of like a Reese's cup on your hand. It's huge. It's huge. But there's a lot of other things that we have. Podcasts are certainly changing the world. Music is certainly different. How many of you have bought a CD lately? Lately, Anybody? Like, what's a CD? We don't buy it. How do we buy our music? We go online or we stream it. So, or YouTube. We watch YouTube. We have some other way to do it. We're not paying for it. So how are these artists making money? Because clearly some of them are making money, right? So how are they making money? And So we have to figure out a new revenue stream. Most artists are making money on concerts. That's the only way they're making money. And what did the pandemic do to that? When's the last time you got to go to a concert? Uh, yeah, probably a year ago. Some of them have gotten very smart. Apparently, at 
not too long ago in Lincoln, Garth Brooks is apparently putting on concerts. And the way they're doing that is they have a parking lot, and they set up speakers in the parking lot. He does it somewhere else, they beam it to them, and you pay by the car. So in this case in Lincoln, it was $110 for a car load to go in and listen to Garth Brooks. I, I'm not, I can't even wrap my head around that, but you know what? People did it. He's apparently making money with it. So the other term you're going to see is digital rights management. So if you're an artist, do you want everybody just to copy your music? No, you want to make money on it somehow. That's your hope anyway. So DRM is a way that we restrict that. So you can't copy that movie. You can't copy that sound. So entertainment has changed around us. And we now go, man, I'm going to get on Netflix, or I'm going to get on Hulu, or I'm going to find, I don't know many people anymore who subscribe to conventional cable. But Comcast, what do they do? Since they control most of the Internet market, what do they do? They price your Internet service up, right? They're going to, yeah, they're, well, or they're, you can get the bundle or something strange. So the heavily, most heavily trafficked site in the world, YouTube, in terms of raw data going to it. Well, and guess who owns YouTube? Google. Huh. Those guys make some money. Online gaming, pretty popular. Some of you may be online gamers. Did anybody in here play Pokemon Go when it first came out? You guys are, some of you are like, man, you're goobers. But it was kind of fun. You got out, wander around. The amount of money they make on some of those online games is staggering. And the one I really don't get is there's sites like Twitch. Does everybody know what Twitch is? Have, you, have we heard of Twitch? Twitch is a video game network where people record themselves playing video games and you can watch them play the video game. Or live stream, the better term. Wait, what? You're paying to watch somebody stream, play a video game. And there are actually people in this area. There's a, there's a young kid in, in Omaha that was featured in the Omaha World Herald. Makes over 100 grand a year on Twitch. Playing video games and having other people stream it. Just playing video Maybe there's something to it. Had you told, they have sponsors. We are, join, we are joining an eSports network here. Hopefully we're going to have an eSports group. Or a, but there are colleges. eSports is a college campus athletic event now. And I still can't wrap my head around that. I've been spent 25 years telling you to quit playing video games and study. And now you can get a scholarship playing video games. A friend of mine's son has a full ride scholarship to a university to play video games. Wait. Yeah, I lost what I'm like, wait, what am I, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. Hey, guys, go play video games tonight. Let's get wrapped up. Let's get. Yeah, we're going to stop baseball. <coughs> it's crazy. It's different. The world is changing. And sometimes, and maybe I'm just jealous because I suck at video games. Although, for my birthday, I bought myself a video game. So, we, we have Nintendo Switches for the kids, and I actually bought Zelda. Because I remember that playing that on the Nintendo 64, and it had like four buttons. And I'm playing this and going, yeah, I can't play it. No, I actually had fun playing. It's kind of interesting. Online shopping, has that changed our world? In fact, most of us don't buy, and, and the pandemic has made it even worse. We can't go anywhere to buy anything. So what do we do? Well, let's see. We can go on to our friend Amazon. Amazon is the devil, right? And I say that because I looked, and I had 161 Amazon deliveries last year. My wife, that's not my wife's account. I don't know how many she had. Every day there's boxes at our house. I don't even, at this point, I don't even know what's coming. I got a message saying I have a package being delivered today. I don't even know what it is. I've lost track. In larger cities, 
you can go on Amazon or some of the other stores. You don't. You can buy your groceries. They show up in a couple of hours. I don't even have to go out to buy groceries. It's to go food. It all delivers to your house. There, there is so high V in, in a lot of places delivers. In fact, during the pandemic, Zach, my athletic trainer son, he couldn't obviously do much athletic training when there's no college athletes, right? So he actually was bored. So he got a part-time job at High V, and that's what he did was go shopping for people with a list. He got it's it's Zach. My my stepson is a little different. He also gets stressed out and he runs. Is anybody in here a runner? Same. I yeah, I, I hear you. He runs, but it's different. He runs these marathons. And so I talked to him the other day. He goes, man, I was all stressed out about something. He goes, I just went out and ran, and I noticed I'd ran 18 miles, then I still had to go about six miles home. 18 miles? I'm like, why? When he would stay here for the summer, he would jog over to Peru, jog up the trail into Nebraska City, get a drink, and then jog back to all the way to Auburn. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I don't understand it. But... He, he's, he's in far better shape than I am, so we'll say that. These, these stores, though, have changed. And if a store can't change, what happens to them? How many stores are you seeing closing right now? Can't go to Pier 1 anymore, right? No. What about Forever 21? Oh, what about Justice? Oh. So all these stores are closing, and in some cases they couldn't compete. What about Sears? When's the last time you went to a Sears store? Long time. And Sears, though, if you think about it, was really the original eBay, and they couldn't figure out the online piece. Yeah. If they could have figured out the online piece, we might be really saying, hey, look, great, I can go buy stuff at Sears. There are now car services. I can buy a car online. So something like Carvana, they will actually deliver the car to my door and say, here's your car you just bought. And they will take yours in a trade-in. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I have not gone to that extreme, but I will say the last vehicle I bought, when I bought my truck a year ago, I did all of the transaction online, and I only went up and looked at it to make sure it really was what I thought it was, and signed the paperwork at the dealership. And I was in and out in 30 minutes. It's a different world. Shopping online is different. And it's changing our, our, our view of the world. It's also changed the way we travel. Now, travel right now, I know that's kind of sad when I talk about travel, because are any of us traveling? No. No. And in fact, some people, we've had a couple students who are actually stuck in their home country that are international students because they couldn't get back for school this year. So traveling's different. But when I do travel, I can find all kinds of new information. And most of us haven't ever folded out a map and looked at it. When I took driver's ed, 40, whatever it was, 23, I don't remember how long ago, one of the studies I had to do to learn driver's ed was how to fold a map. That was an assignment. You know the last time I looked at a map to go anywhere? What do I do? I go, Google Maps or Siri. I go, hey, Siri, map me to this address, and it magically shows me a route. And I will tell you there are times when I'm, wish I had a map because I'm pretty sure wherever Siri has taken me is not in the right direction and right place. Oh, did I? No. <laughs> Hush. So. It's changed the world we live in. And so I want to introduce you to one really cool site. I don't have time to do it, so we'll finish that up on Wednesday. But there is a website that I think is the greatest thing in terms of navigation. It's even better than my phone magical maps, which sometimes lead you astray. Internally, though, we have a couple of things we need to talk about really quickly. So intranets, so the internet is outside. The intranet is internal networks. 
<coughs> so at our college, we have one. And we can see things inside the network. Most companies do those. Verp VPNs are virtual private network. In other words, my computer at home, I connect to a server and I tunnel. I encrypt it. So it's all scrambled from one place to another. It's using tunneling. If your company isn't doing that and you're working from home, you probably need to rethink their strategy. Because that tunneling will allow you to protect that information. So if you're a healthcare provider, you're not releasing out healthcare information. It's tunneled back to that information. And so VPNs are the way that we protect information. Where I wanted to get to was I wanted to start this, and I have a video. So I'm going to start this on Wednesday, Internet of Things. So make sure you read about Internet of Things. It's not just Alexa in your house. So I have a video, and I have this. We'll finish up the chapter and do a quick review on Wednesday.